For the past 30 years, the German artist Gunther Dimnig has been installing these little brass stones in the city streets in Europe. More than 7,000 of them have been installed now in 1,200 different cities and towns. He places them right in front of a house where one of the victims of the Holocaust used to live or where the house used to stand. Each one says simply, here lived, and the name of the person, their year of birth, and something about their final fate. The inscription is so small that if you want to read it, you have to bow down in humble tribute to the deceased to be able to read it. These memorials are called Stolperstein, which in German means stumbling stones, but you wouldn't literally trip on them. They're flush with the street, so they wouldn't make you stumble. They're moral stumbling blocks. They're a reminder of the horrors of the Holocaust so that no one can forget what happened. We all know of Holocaust deniers. Hopefully we don't know too many of them personally, but we know that they exist. The crimes of the Nazis were so horrible and the damage to the self-esteem of Germans as well as all of their sympathizers throughout Europe who shared their anti-Semitic prejudice, their shame was so great that they'd come up with elaborate attempts at denying that it ever happened. Some claim that the accepted figure of six million victims is dramatically inflated. Others deny that there ever were death camps or gas ovens. They say that the Jews were just forced to leave, but they never killed the Jews or the Roma or the disabled or gay people. Say what you will about freedom of speech, but it is currently illegal to deny the Holocaust in Germany. It is illegal to display a swastika or Nazi symbols or to wear a Nazi uniform or to publish anything that attempts to praise Adolf Hitler. Germans realized the danger of allowing people to pretend that they had not done what they clearly had done. And so there are no statues in honor of Hitler in Germany, but there are many memorials to the victims of the Nazis. And now there are these tens of thousands of reminders of specific individuals in front of this house or down that street. It is their hope that by remembering their true history that they would be much less likely to ever let themselves go back to that place in time. There are currently resurgences of neo-Nazi movements in Germany just as there are fascists all around the world. There's a certain attraction to strongman governments when people are filled with fear and paranoia. But if you care to know enough about real history, you know that following the path of fascism is a path you never want to follow. Every nation has a certain amount of mythology about how they were founded and why they are the greatest, if not one of the greatest, of the nations of the world. I grew up in the 60s when news of protests against the war in Vietnam, reports on civil rights demonstrations that sometimes turned into riots were on TV every night. I remember the assassinations of John and Bobby Kennedy, of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I knew at some level that my country was being torn apart, but when I got to school, and for me in those years, it was a segregated all-white school, what we were taught about the Pilgrims and our founding fathers, the Revolutionary War, Paul Revere, George Washington, it was all just wonderful and noble. And it all served to prove how lucky we were to have been born into this amazing country. Based on my public school education, America had never done anything wrong. We romanticized the American Indians, but we never acknowledged the genocide or the Indian Removal Act that left nothing but 
the arrowheads that we found in the freshly plowed fields on the family farm as a sign that Indians had ever been in Kentucky. And though it may be hard for you to believe, my family even romanticized slavery. We were poor, my grandparents and my great-grandparents were even more poor, but there was a family mythology of a time of wealth and prestige when my ancestors were plantation owners and slave traders. My college and grad school classes were a great deal more factual about history, though criticisms of American foreign policy felt suspicious to me for a long, long time because I really had a hard time letting go of believing that America never did anything wrong on purpose. And of course, most of my education had to do with theology, philosophy, and biblical history. It wasn't until I pretty much had my degrees in the bag that I began to pay attention to American history, and my education was rather abrupt. I had a chance to hear and to meet the famous historian Howard Zinn at our local university earlier in this century. I met him again at Drury, where I taught, and then later at Harvard when I was a fellow there. And at Harvard, I had a chance to have a longer personal conversation with him. His book, A People's History of the United States, along with James Lowen's book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, were two of the most eye-opening and painful history books I have ever read. I highly recommend them both, and if you're not a big reader, there are several audiobook versions that you can listen to as you drive. But seriously, don't skip over these books. Please, give them a read or a listen. Sure, there is some disappointment about learning where all of America's stumbling blocks have been, many of which we've known, We had to have known, (laughs) but at least among white families, we never let ourselves feel differently about it than the way we had been taught to feel about it. We had to know that the genocide of Native Americans, we had to know that the enslavement of millions of Africans was evil. But you know, we didn't grow up visiting the Native American Holocaust Museum because there wasn't one. And we not only didn't see monuments dedicated to slaves and the contribution of African Americans to the building of our nation, our economic and military strength. In fact, most of us in the South grew up seeing monuments to the people who tried to keep Africans in slavery. In fact, Right up until recently, we had people repeating the ridiculously cleaned-up version of the Civil War, insisting that it was all about states' rights and that it had nothing to do with slavery. We should realize that most of our public school history books would be illegal if we had the same kind of laws about honesty uh, that the Germans have. People have fought to defend the placement of Confederate monuments in honor of our equivalent of Hitler's in America's 19th century history, insisting that no black American American should take offense at those statues and that any white person with a conscience should never find a reason to object to them. However, the Confederate states actually wrote legislative statements about why they were seceding from the Union, and darned if they don't talk about slavery as being the only reason for their actions. Just Google Confederate State Succession Statements, and your 10-second investment in research will show you what your white ancestors were fighting for. Mississippi's document makes it unapologetically clear. It says... Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce on the earth. To paraphrase Forrest Gump, I'm not a smart man, 
but I know what racism is. But all of our stumbling blocks are not quite so easy to spot. A decade ago, I was asked to organize a conference for a large Unitarian church in Florida in which Bishop John Shelby Spong and I were to be the speakers. And I brought Sean and Barry and other musicians from our church for this three-day event. I did not know, however, that this invitation had not actually met with the full-throated approval of the host pastor, who spent most of those three days trying to make things as difficult for me as possible which just goes on the list of reasons why I don't really like ministers very much, but I'm not going to chase that rabbit into the woods right now. In one of my talks, I referenced the fact, which I had learned from the eminent American historian Howard Zinn, that Truman's decision to drop atom bombs on Japan was not really about defeating Japan. The war was virtually over already. We had already defeated them. But military brass was eager to try out their new weapon in battle, albeit against a mostly civilian population. And Truman wanted the Russians to know that we both had the bomb and that we were willing to use it. When I said that, the host pastor shouted in front of the two to 300 people filling the hall, that's not true. Now, obviously, He didn't know anything about it, but like a lot of uneducated, childish adults, he didn't want it to be true, and because he didn't like the historical facts, he just shouted out a total dismissal. But that is not out of character with a lot of people in America, and at some points, it's not out of character with all of us. It is hard to stare at our id our shadow. But until we do, it's nearly impossible to not go on repeating any mistake that we refuse to acknowledge. We really should take a lesson from the Germans and be willing to be reminded of our own stumbling blocks before we mess up again. We have lately been treated to, at this recording, seven different hearings from the Congressional Committee that is investigating the January 6, 2001 violent insurrection at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Even though people all over the world watched this brazen attack on America's symbol of democracy and freedom, multiple Republican politicians have tried to dismiss it, saying that it was just tourists who got a little out of hand. Like Holocaust deniers, they are insisting on their spin of the facts to make themselves seem to be innocent of what they actually did, which was to try to overthrow American democracy. It was shocking 18 months ago to see rioters desecrating that building and actually carrying Confederate flags into our Capitol building where they had never been seen before, not even during the Civil War. But the hypocrisy that doesn't begin and end right there. What the insurrectionists would not likely have known is that this building, this 200-year-old symbol of freedom and democracy, was actually constructed by about 1,500 African slaves who literally carried their chains with them while they worked to build this citadel of freedom. The argument conservatives are making against teaching critical race theory in our public schools, and by that they mean anything that mentions slavery or institutionalized racism in our government and in our laws, is of a cloth with German Holocaust deniers of the last century and, unfortunately, of this century. I am simply making the modest proposal that we all stop turning away from the truth and stop filling our kids' heads with lies that they will then have to unlearn later. Because if we want a better quality of leader than what we have seen in elected office trying to protect the Capitol rioters, then we're going to need to educate our children a lot better than those guys were educated. 
We absolutely need to provide the next generation with history books that tell the truth about Native American genocide, the African slave trade, the violence against labor unions, the repression of women's rights from voting to birth control to abortion. Our kids need to know about the failings of our justice system, the racial disparity in the application of the death penalty, and the incarceration of people of color for offenses that would never even show up in most white people's criminal history. We need this kind of honest education for exactly the same reasons that Germany doesn't allow people to lie about their history and why their landscape is punctuated with reminders of the moral stumbling blocks that led to the Holocaust. I don't want people to feel badly about being Americans. I just want America to become the country that was described in my public school education. And the truth is the only path we can follow to ever become that nation. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.